All right, this speaker you really could ask about the who, our next speaker, so Ani Patel. So Ani Patel is a professor of psychology in the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, part of what I love about Ani's work is he takes something that you think you're quite familiar with and it's just kind of fun and he's going to show us that there's a lot more going on than we realize and it can actually have practical implications. So he works in the area of music cognition, studying the mental processes involved in making, perceiving, and responding to music. Two areas of special interest are the relationship between music and language and the processing of musical rhythm. In his work, he's used a number of approaches, including human brain imaging, theoretical analyses, acoustic research, and comparative work with other species, including a very talented bird you're going to hear about shortly. Ani? Thank you. Well, I want to talk about some surprising things we've learned about the human mind by studying musical rhythm. So let's start with very basic, what seemingly basic aspect of rhythm, and that's the beat. We're all familiar with the beat. It's what we tap our foot to or dance to when we go out to dance. Um, and all over the world, there's music with a beat. Every culture has music. Every culture has some form of music with a beat. And all over the world, people have kind of a characteristic response to music with a beat. It starts early in life. It seems to kind of spring out from us almost as if it were innate. Let me show you a video to illustrate. that coming from? I mean, why do we have that kind of response to music? It seems primal. It seems to be tapping into something very deep in our, our biology even. And actually, this is an old intuition. It goes back to Charles Darwin, who actually spent 10 pages in his great book on human evolution, The Descent of Man, writing and thinking about music. And he felt that musical rhythm, in particular, tapped into deep and ancient aspects of animal biology. And that is a beautiful intuition, because rhythm is everywhere in the animal biology world. There's rhythm of the heartbeat, there's rhythm of walking, there's the rhythm of breathing. Well, it's a great idea, but it's being challenged by modern research that's providing some kind of surprising results, including the result that other primates don't seem to process rhythm the way we do. But let's talk about what beat is first. Well, one of the fundamental aspects of beat is, it's pre our perception of the beat is that it's predictive. To perceive a beat is to predict the beat. And you can show this in a very simple experiment using a metronome. This kind of study has been done for over a century. You bring somebody into the lab and you ask them to tap along with a metronome. They don't need any special training in music. People all can do it, and they do it in a very characteristic way. They tend to line up their taps very closely in time with the ticks of the metronome. Now, you cannot do that by reacting to metronome ticks, right? If you waited for each tick and then you pressed a button, you'd always be behind by a couple of hundred milliseconds. You must be anticipating. You must be predicting. And people don't need any instruction to do this. It's just kind of how they operate. Another key feature of beat uh, processing is that it's uh, flexible. So that metronome could be going at half the rate. It could be going at twice the rate. And people will easily lock on and do this kind of accurate prediction. So one of the first big surprises in research on beat processing came when researchers tried for the first time in the history of psychology and neuroscience to train monkeys to tap to a beat in order to study the underlying neural mechanisms. Now, you might think this is going to be exactly the kind of thing monkeys would be good at. I mean, we know they're really intelligent. They're good at learning complex sensory motor tasks in the lab. This seems like a simple task. Well, it turned out to be a different story. Monkeys typically take a month or two to learn a task. In the lab, these monkeys required a year of training to learn to tap with a metronome. Five hours a day, five days a week of training. To learn, okay? And when they finally did learn to tap, they always tapped a couple hundred milliseconds after each metronome click. It's as if they were predominantly reacting, not spontaneously predicting, which is what we do. So this didn't really fit with the idea, um, Darwin's idea, that this is beat, the way we process beat is just tapping into ancient and fundamental aspects of human brain function or of animal brain function, excuse me. The next surprise came from human brain imaging, having people lie in an MRI scanner and have their brains imaged to see what areas were more active when they are perceiving a beat. The surprise was it wasn't just auditory areas, which you might expect, but a network of regions, including strongly activated motor regions of the brain, including regions that help you plan movements, motor planning regions. Now, these people were lying still. They weren't imagining movement, but their motor system was going crazy. And it's, we think these motor planning regions are actually helping people predict the timing of beats, perhaps through an inner simulation of action without actually producing real action. 
Now, I think that's interesting because we talk about feeling the beat in music, not just hearing the beat, but feeling the beat. And maybe one reason we're tempted to use that language is that in the brain, beat perception is not just an auditory phenomenon. It's an auditory motor phenomenon. Well, these sorts of results had really intrigued me. And the, the monkey data and the human data, and I began to think, well, perhaps there's more to beat than just this kind of simple entrainment of basic biological processes. In fact, I began to think maybe it requires neural specializations that we have for a particular reason. And I hypothesized that we have this ability because we have another ability that connects auditory and motor processing in a very sophisticated way. That's called vocal learning, the ability to imitate complex sounds. We all take it for granted. When you learn a language, you have to learn to speak the sounds of that language. Well, it turns out that's an unusual ability in the, in the animal kingdom. We're the only primate that has that ability. All other primates are born with a small, instinctive set of calls that they learn how to give. I mean, they don't learn how to give, they learn when to give, but they, can't, they don't learn them and don't seem to learn new ones. But we're not the only vocal learning animal. We, we know from research with other animals that vocal learning requires a specialized brain. And this is best known from studies of birds because some birds, like songbirds, are vocal learners. They learn their songs from listening to their parents. And some birds, like pigeons, are not vocal learners. They have innate instinctive calls. When scientists look at the brains of these birds, they find that there's a number of motor regions having to do with motor planning that are specialized that appear in the vocal learning brain. And those regions are richly connected to auditory regions, similar to what we see in beat processing. So I hypothesized that perhaps it was only vocal learners that had this capacity to, to feel a beat and synchronize to a beat. This was published as a purely theoretical idea. And uh, in fact, I never really thought it would get a chance to test it until um, the internet being the wonderful thing it is, a, a, a colleague sent me a, a video of a parrot dancing to a musical beat, or what seemed like a parrot dancing to a musical beat. This being a YouTube video, I had no idea of what was going on <laughs> behind the camera. Was the parrot just imitating a human? Was it a mechanical parrot? I had no idea what was going on. But I luckily was able to contact the owner and say, you know, this is more than uh, just a kind of stupid pet trick. This is potentially a really important scientific <laughs> finding. Because we don't know any other animals that can do this. So will you collaborate with me? Will you do a real scientific study? And thankfully, she said yes. She had actually had training as a biologist, though she ran a pet shelter. And she said, sure. And so we videoed Snowball, the cockatoo, dancing, unfortunately not to the Who. That would have been perfect. But um, to the Backstreet Boys. So you know, <laughs> take what you can get. Um, and Snowball, we slowed down and sped up the song to different degrees to see if he could move predictably to the beat in a way that was like us, with flexible, without any cues from another, uh, from a human being. And we found out that he did. And it was the first case of another species. And it fit the kind of hypothesis. So let me show you a, a video from this work. Now, this is a video of Snowball dancing to a sped up version of the song. It's actually 20% faster than the original song. And remember, he hasn't rehearsed. He has, you know, we haven't <laughs> taken him backstage. This is his spontaneous reaction to this music. And it's a little too fast for him, actually. But you'll see how he figures that out. <coughs> So it's really quite remarkable that not only does he dance to the beat, he does something humans do. Because when we dance, we don't just bob up and down, right? We do kind of simultaneous movements. We just go side to side while we bob up and down. We kind of <laughs> subdivide the beat. And he's doing that. Uh, and again, he hasn't been trained to do this. So this, this kind of evolutionary work, um, this was interesting because it, just, it didn't fit with the idea that beat is a widespread facility of animal brains. It seems like maybe you need a specialized brain to do this, maybe a brain that does vocal learning. So this kind of evolutionary work continues to interest me. But it's a fair question to ask whether learning about beat can help us do anything practical in the real world. And I think the answer is yes. Because it turns out the beat can help people with Parkinson's disease. Now, Parkinson's disease is, is a very serious disease, as you know. Many of you may know people with Parkinson's. It affects 7 to 10 million people worldwide. The biology is. Um, fairly well understood. It starts when cells in a particular part of the brain begin to die. These are cells that produce dopamine and that project broadly to other regions of the brain, especially motor and cognitive areas. And the deficits involved in Parkinson's disease are serious deficits in motor behavior and in cognition. And in one thing we all take for granted is walking. And that becomes a real challenge in Parkinson's disease, the ability to initiate walking and to walk fluidly. And this can lead to all kinds of problems and, and risks for these patients. 
Well, it turns out empirically that music with a beat helps people with Parkinson's disease to walk, at least some patients. And I want to show you a video to illustrate that. This comes from Connie Tamino, who's a colleague of Oliver Sacks in New York City. And this is from their clinic. And this video, it'll take a minute. Uh, you, you can see this Parkinson's patient. You can, you can see how she's sort of frozen. She has a characteristic sort of mask of Parkinsonism. She's a little uh, not too steady on her feet. And she's waiting for a therapist to come and uh, st waiting for one of the therapists to start the music. And what I want you to pay attention to in this video, uh, you can see the shuffling gait there. Um, is what happens when the music comes on, how she moves, and in particular, how her footfalls relate to the timing of the musical beat. So it's quite a striking clinical phenomenon, and there are therapies that are being built around that today. But we don't really understand the mechanisms of it. We need more research, basic research on beat processing to understand how that's possible, how these auditory motor circuits can take over and re-energize and reactivate a motor system that is seriously debilitated by this disease, at least temporarily while the music is on. Um, so the beat and Parkinson's disease is an area that we need to work on. Well, can we go, I want to now switch gears a little bit and talk about another aspect of musical rhythm besides the beat. Because there's more to musical rhythm than the beat, right? There's all sorts of complex timing patterns in music. Well, another domain that has t complex timing patterns is language. We use timing patterns to communicate with each other all the time. And a, a, one of the themes of my research over the years has been kind of hidden relationships between music and language. And so is it possible that some of the mechanisms we use to process musical rhythm are also used to process language? It's becoming an interesting question because there's some recent research that shows that young children's timing abilities, their abilities to, say, tell two rhythms apart, non-linguistic rhythms, or to listen to a rhythm and repeat it back, correlate with their ability to segment words into their individual sounds. Now, that's a key part of learning how to read. You've got to break words into their individual parts and understand that words have sounds that they're made up of and be able to manipulate those sounds. So the idea that there might be a relationship between this temporal patterning in language and temporal patterning in music is exciting because it potentially has relevance for children with dyslexia. Because if you can get to a child who's at risk for dyslexia, even before they learn how to read and use rhythm as a fun kind of intervention for them and yet improve their language processing that way, that could potentially lessen the burden of their dyslexia later in life. So to talk to you about some of the research we're doing along these lines, I want to introduce a graduate student at Tufts, Ola orzanov palchik She's in the new cognitive science PhD program, working with me and Professor Marianne Wolf in the, the Department of Child Study and Human Development. Ola has been doing really innovative research that, that bridges these departments, not an easy thing to do, and she's just led a very successful and complex research project looking at the relationship between rhythmic processing and language processing in kindergartners, and I want her to give you a chance to talk, talk about that. Developmental dyslexia is a prevalent disability affecting 5 to 17 percent of people. Research has demonstrated the importance of early intervention to optimize the educational outcomes of at-risk children. There is some evidence that rhythm training in older students with dyslexia can improve reading skills, but it is not yet clear if rhythm is linked to early reading development. In our research, we, we aim to investigate the association between early literacy development and musical rhythm. We developed a rhythm discrimination app we called Rhythm School. We administered this app to over 150 students and found that across the grades, there's a strong association between children's rhythm discrimination skills and their reading abilities. We investigated this association between reading and rhythm further and found that the path from rhythm to literacy is not a direct one. It passes through a more basic ability to identify and manipulate speech sounds. This skill is called phonological awareness and it forms the foundation for reading acquisition. It is the same skill that is often impaired in individuals with dyslexia. If the same cognitive mechanisms are important for phonological awareness 
and for musical rhythm, as suggested by our findings. And we can use musical rhythm intervention to enhance phonological awareness skills and subsequently reading even prior to reading instruction. For children who are at risk for dyslexia, this could mean sparing them the dire consequences of the currently practiced waiting to fail approach. It is waiting until the child has failed to develop reading skills in second or third grade in order to intervene. Music education can start as early as infancy, and it is fun, engaging, and has amazing effects on brain reorganization. Our research is taking some exciting direction. In the collaboration of researchers at Boston Children's Hospital and MIT, we get to peek at the brains of young children performing a phonological task inside the brain scanner. And to see which brain regions that are active during the task are associated with better reading performance. This could help us understand what are the neural structures that are important both for musical rhythm and language. Additionally, in the next several months, we will be deploying our app as part of the Global Literacy Project across several sites across the world. In its current form, the app will gather data about rhythm discrimination skills in different cultures and languages. In the more distant future, it is our personal dream to develop a rhythm intervention app that would enhance the lives of children with dyslexia locally and children who have no access to adequate schooling globally. Thank you. So I, I think you can see what, how hap, why I'm so happy to have Ola at Tufts. Um, she's not only taken this project and done a wonderful job in Boston, she's connected work at Tufts to other institutions and now through this project with global uh, literacy, it's gonna go around the world. So I hope we've given you a flavor of some of the surprising things we've learned by studying musical rhythm and the brain. And I have to say, one of the things that makes Tufts special is when I was in graduate school, the idea of going and talking to somebody in another lab in your own department was considered kind of crazy and maybe a little subversive. And at Tufts, is just fundamentally unlike that. Not only do they encourage people to interact within departments, they actually have mechanisms for people to interact across departments, and Ola is a great example of that by fostering this relationship between myself and Professor Marianne Wolf through the Tufts Collaborates program. So music in the brain is a young field, and I think it's a field that's going to thrive at institutions like Tufts that encourage you to connect things that happen in one department to another. So I want to thank the administration for supporting that, and I want to thank you for your attention.